Um, Nietzsche, of course, was the great prophet of the death of God and, and a prognosticator of what the psychological consequences of the demise of this classic meaning structure that was unbelievably ancient, what, what the collapse of that actually meant. I mean, you, you can think about Christianity and then maybe you could think about the Judaism that it was embedded in as even an older system. But that Judaism emerged out of the Middle East, partly out of Egypt, which was enmeshed in even an older belief system, and that was enmeshed in something absolutely prehistoric. That, and so it was a continuum in some sense of adaptive structures that, that reigned supreme essentially right until, well, right until the scientific revolution. And so we're outside of that now, we're in a different paradigm and there are consequences to that. And that was the sort of thing that Nietzsche was concentrating on. And he actually in some ways made it worse because Nietzsche was an incredible critic of Christianity. I mean, he wrote a book called The Antichrist and all he did in that book brilliantly was take dogmatic Christianity to task. Now, one of the things he did say, which is very interesting was that Christianity died at its own hand. So his notion was that because Christianity, say Judeo-Christianity, had elevated truth to the highest virtue, that that search for truth then ended up undermining the axioms of Christianity itself. So it developed a tool, a, a, an unbelievably powerful analytic tool, and then used it to, well, it's like we were sitting on a branch and sawed it off with the saw that we had invented, and then everyone fell. And Dostoevsky, well, Dostoevsky was an Orthodox Christian, and, and, but an also an extraordinarily brilliant man, and he was absolutely terrified at, a, at what the consequences of the dissolution of that belief system was going to mean for Russia in particular. And Dostoevsky explored nihilism great, in a, to a great degree in Notes from Underground and in Crime and Punishment, because the murderer in Crime and Punishment is essentially nihilistic. He's a nihilistic narcissist, roughly speaking, and that's what compels him to commit murder. But Dostoevsky also wrote a book called The Devils, which is an amazing book, where he predicted that the death of Christ, the sudden death of Christianity in the Soviet, in Russia, was going to produce the catastrophic totalitarian horrors of the Soviet Union. And he predicted that in like 1880, 1890, which was 30 years before the revolution. Absolutely remarkable. Nietzsche, a genius, Nietzsche was a full professor when that was impossible, I think when he was 24, and that just never happened. And, and so his, his extraordinary genius was recognized very early, uh, and, uh, but he was also extraordinarily ill, sick, physically. His dad died at about 40 of something they called softening of the brain, which was actually a fairly common diagnostic category back then. No one really knows what it was, some people have suggested that he had syphilis from one sexual encounter or that it was hereditary, but nobody really knows. But anyways, his father died young and, and Nietzsche died very young as well. He went, he was very, he was mentally incapacitated for the last few years of his life and, and died, and died after that. And so he could only serve as a professor for a while because he couldn't see very well and he was always sick and he ended up living in this little village, I believe in Switzerland, where he wrote his books, and he could only write a paragraph or two at a time without, be, before he became very ill, and so his writing is extraordinarily condensed and dense and brilliant, brilliant, and he's, I think he gave away, I think Beyond Good and Evil, which is his masterpiece, although he had many, I think it only sold 500 copies in his lifetime. So he, he also believed that he was only writing for himself. He didn't really know if, if anybody was ever going to pay any attention to what he said, but they certainly did. So I would say he, was, he ended up being certainly one of the 10 most influential people of the late 19th and early 20th century. This is an example of his writing. Of what is great, one must either be silent or speak with greatness. With greatness, that means cynically and with innocence. What I relate is the history of the next two centuries. I describe what is coming, what can no longer come differently, the advent of nihilism. Our whole European culture is moving from some time now, moving for some time now, with a tortured tension that is growing from decade to decade as towards a catastrophe, restlessly, violently, headlong, like a river that wants to reach the end, that no longer reflects that's afraid to reflect. 
He that speaks here has conversely done nothing so far but to reflect as a philosopher and solitary by instinct who has found his advantage in standing aside, outside. Why has the advent of nihilism become necessary? Sorry about that. Because the values we have had hitherto thus draw their final consequence. Because nihilism represents the ultimate logical conclusion of our great values and ideals. Because we must experience nihilism before we can find out what value those values really had. We require at some time new values. Nihilism stands at the door. Whence comes this uncanniest of all guests? Point of departure. This is a good example of how Nietzsche, he, Nietzsche said he philosophized with a hammer. And, and it's, it's, it means that he spent hours, days, weeks, months, concentrating on how to make a single sentence as packed with significance as he could possibly manage. And so Nietzsche said, it's the best arrogant statement I've ever read. He said, I can say in a sentence what it takes other people a whole book to say. And then he said, what, what they can't say in a whole book. That's pretty good, eh? It's like, the first one's a real, like, blow to the solar plexus. And the second one is like, I can top that with no problem. Point of departure. It is an error to consider social distress or physiological degeneration or the corruption of all things as the cause of nihilism. That's a critique of the later Freudian ideas, right there and then. Because what Nietzsche says was, look, if things are going wrong for you, or if they're going wrong in general, it's really straightforward to say that, well, there's something wrong with society, that would be social distress, or there's some physiological degeneration, there's something wrong with you physically, or everything is just corrupted, being itself is corrupt. Which is a classic explanation, right? You hear that all the time. You think, well, people are suffering for one reason or another. Well, why? Well, there's something wrong biologically or society is corrupted and, and everything is unfair. Nietzsche says, no, no, you're not going to get away with that. First, he says, ours is the most honest and compassionate age, comparing modern civilization, let's say, to everything that, com that has come before it. So speaking of corruption is not something you can do lightly. And then he says, and this is remarkable, distress whether psychic, physical, or intellectual, need not at all produce nihilism. That is the radical rejection of value, meaning, and desirability. Such distress always permits a variety of interpretations. Well, that's a rough one. It's like, well, you had a rough childhood. Well, someone else who had your childhood might not have drawn those conclusions. So here's an example. You know that most people who abuse children were abused by chil with, as children, right? But! Most people who are abused as children do not grow up to abuse children. And you can figure that out arithmetically, because if it, was, if it was the case that everyone abused grew up to abuse, in about four generations everyone would be being beat to death in childhood as a matter of course, because it would spread exponentially. That isn't what happens, it dampens. And why is that? Well, if you're bullied as a child, we could say, well, you could draw two conclusions, causal conclusions. Being bullied caused me to be a bully. Fair enough, man, that's an understandable story. How about being bullied caused me not ever to be a bully? Well, why is that any less reasonable a conclusion? It's frequently one that people draw, and since the two opposite conclusions can be drawn from the same set of experiences, you cannot say that the experiences caused the conclusions. And that's Nietzsche's critique of, say, sociological or psychological determinism with regards to the optimism or pessimism, pessimism of your worldview. Such distress always permits a variety of interpretations. Right. Rather, it is in one particular interpretation, the Christian moral one, that nihilism is rooted. The end of Christianity at the hands of its own morality. That was the development of the sense of truth, which cannot be replaced, which turns against the Christian God. The sense of truthfulness highly developed by Christianity is nauseated by the falseness and mendaciousness of all Christian interpretations of the world and of history. A remarkable claim. And then this one's even worse. It's absolutely brilliant, I think. Rebound from God is truth to the fanatical faith, all is false. That's nihilism. An act of Buddhism. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche explains that. And this is, you know, I talked talk to you guys a little bit about the idea of the game and the metagame. You know, the metagame being the set of all games. Nietzsche 
draws on a conception like that for this criticism because he says when you lose faith in something and, and that happens to people very frequently when you lose faith in something because you're human and because you can abstract it's not only that you lose faith in that thing, that person, that system the fact that you've lost faith in that indicates to you that it's possible to lose faith in anything in every system, in every person once burnt, forever shy and that's nihilism. The fact that one thing can collapse on you can make you completely unwilling to manifest any faith in anything whatsoever. And that's the emergence of nihilism. The end of the moral interpretation of the world, which no longer has any sanction after it has tried to escape into beyond, lie, leads to nihilism. Another critique of Christianity embedded in that sentence, he said, well, Christianity needed to be destroyed even by itself because it puts so much emphasis on the afterworld on heaven that it forgot completely about life now and here and because of that needed to be destroyed because life here is sufficiently rife with suffering so it needs to be addressed and and people it's 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 wrong it's incorrect to inform people that they should wait for some hereafter and justify their suffering in that manner and so he would say in some sense that even the idea of compassion, which is central to Christianity, is also one of the reasons why Christianity collapsed under its own weight. The untenability of one interpretation of the world upon which a tremendous amount of energy has been lavished awakens the suspicion that all interpretations of the world are false. Well, so what? You might say, well, so what if you don't believe in anything? Well, I would take a neuropsychological approach to that most of the positive emotion, positive emotions, dopaminergic it's a consequence of the manifestation of the exploratory system that has its roots in the hypothalamus, a very ancient part of the brain it's the same part of the brain that cocaine and heroin, all the drugs that people like to abuse the, the drugs that are exciting, not the drugs that are calming it activates that system, it's the system that's activated when something exciting happens to you or when something novel happens to you but more importantly, it's the system that's activated when you're pursuing a goal and you see that you're moving towards the goal so what does that mean? no goal no positive emotion so you say, well if you have nothing to believe in, if you have no value structure left because a value structure says, this is better than this no value structure no positive emotion well and so what's the problem with that? it's easy to get rid of your positive emotion, that's not a problem because it's rather fragile and tenuous try getting rid of your negative emotion good luck, that is not going to happen so what happens is that if your value system collapses then all you're left with is negative emotion and that is not a good thing, well so Nietzsche would say well why do people flee into the arms of totalitarians from the specter of nihilism it's because totalitarian certainty, even though it involves slavery and the sacrifice of, the, of reason and intellect totalitarian certainty might be preferable to nihilistic chaos well, it's a big problem it's a, it's a, and he said, well I'm telling the story of the next 200 years it's like, well ever since then, for the entire 20th century we bounced between nihilism and totalitarianism with deaths on both sides, constant and we're still doing exactly the same thing